the ARCA Sport Foundation. Uh, thank you very much, Karin, for starting the recording. Um, and I'm also a member of the Technical Subcommittee on Employment Standards, where I'm currently leading the EAD team. Um, and I'm joined today by Gerhard Müller from the Berlin State Library, Prussian Cultural Heritage. Um, and he's leading there the project on the Calliope Union Catalog, which he will be talking about in more detail later on. Sorry, that wasn't a bit too far. Um, today, it's part of a webinar series actually on controlled vocabularies. Uh, we are running two sets for different time zones. So we're currently in the time, in the set for the time zones from Europe, Oceania. Um, and there's a separate time zone for the Americas, um, which we'll also be running today. Uh, there are three sessions in total. We already had one session where we gave an overview of introduction into controlled vocabularies in general. And today we will be talking about encoding controlled terms in archival description. So we will have a closer look at EAD, um, a little bit of a look into EACCPF, and then the example use case that Gerhard will present. Um, and I'd like to kick us off just with a brief introduction and including some general definitions. So what do we mean when we talk about controlled access terms and controlled vocabularies? Um, access terms in general are there to help us discovering, identifying and localizing things, speaking very generally. And things can be um, a record, it can be a person, it can be a place. So anything that might be part of a cover description could potentially be phrased in an access term. When we talk about controlled access terms, um, that means that these terms follow specific rules in their construction. So for example, having the name of a person consisting of their first name, their last name, and maybe their life dates. And then we bring in controlled vocabularies into the picture, which provide the context for those rules. So controlled vocabularies uh, are identified by having a process in place for the creation of terms and potential changes to those terms. Uh, controlled vocabularies are authorized. That is, there is an author authority, um, an organization behind that controlled vocabulary that makes sure that these processes uh, for the creation and changes of terms are adhered to. Um, and controlled vocabularies are ideally being made mm. available for reuse. So that's kind of bringing everything together. When we look at the encoded archival description EAD, there are various contexts in EAD where the encoding is enabled for us to use controlled access terms. The focus of today's session will be the element control access and its sub-elements, but there are also other contexts where you could include those sub-elements, for example, origination when we talk about the records creator or repository when we talk about the holding institution. There are also is index and there are various other places where those terms could be used. Another thing to keep in mind is that all of these are available as well for the highest description level, so the Archdesk level in the EAD file, and for the single component. So you can have it also down to the file level um, and be very specific about it. How does control access look like? Um, and this is something that applies to EAD 2002 as well as it applies to EAD 3. Um, so control access essentially kind of consists of two main parts uh, that you can use um, either together or independently, um, and you can choose with one or the other. So similar to things like the scope content uh, element or the biochist element, control access also has a bunch of text and formatting elements with a header, a paragraph, a list possibility, and things like this. The main thing that we want to look at today, or however, are the entities that you can describe in control access or can name in control access. Um, and those entities include agents, that are the elements corp name, fam name, first name, and name, uh, places with geog name, topics or themes with subject, activities with occupation and function, 
types of material with journal form and works with the element title. And essentially what you will find in all those sub elements of control access are names or titles of those things that we are describing. So names of organizations or groups of people, uh, groups of people with blood relations or from the same household, personal names, generic names, for example, when there's no more precision possible. So when you're not sure if the name uh, that you're finding in your description is the name of a person or the name of a place. Um, or where it might not necessarily be required to have it that specific. Um, names of geographic locations and features. Designations of topics represented in the materials um, of professions, of activities and processes. Uh, for the styles or techniques of the materials, intellectual content, the order of information or object function and physical characteristics, and then formal names of works. So these are the things that you can find in those sub elements, and we will go into more detail in terms of how you can encode them in EAD. So this is how the sub elements of control access in EAD 2002 look like. And you can see um, that there's a little bit of variation in there. So there are some parts that apply to all of them and some parts that only apply to a specific subgroup of them. So all of the sub elements of control access can have text. So they can include text directly in the element. And all of them have general attributes like the audience attribute or the ID attribute. And then what we call vocabulary attributes that allow you to provide some more information about where the term comes from. We'll have a look at those in the next few slides. The agent and the place entrance, so corp name, fem name, person name, name, and duke name, also include the attribute role. So you can say, for example, that the person that you're naming is the creator of the material, or the duke name, the place that you're naming, is the birthplace of a person. And the elements genre form and title both have a type attribute, which kind of gives you a possibility to distinguish between different genres, between different works. So if you're talking about kind of a, a single publication or maybe it's something that is part of a series, you could use the type attribute for that. And then the title element also has a few kind of bibliographic fields, which are not applicable to the other sub elements of control access. So starting with the text that mm. can be included in the control access sub elements, um, ideally that would be a term from either a local, national or international control vocabulary. For example, the name Albert Einstein. Looking then at the vocabulary attributes that we have available with all those sub elements of control access. Um, we can start, for example, with the attribute source uh, by giving the vocabulary that is the source of the term that we have used. For example, if we have used Albert Einstein from the virtual international authority file, we would include the abbreviation VF in the source attribute. Following up from that, there also is the auth file number, the authority file number. So the identifier or the URI, the term has within the control vocabulary that I'm taking it from. So in the context of VF, this is the URI that would represent Albert Einstein. You also can name the rules governing the formulation of the element's content. Um, that is possibly inherent to the vocabulary that are using. Uh, it might also be coming from a completely different standard, um, but you can name that standard in the rules attribute. And the last one is the normal attribute, and it kind of functions similar to what you might know from the date elements, where we have the textual date information in the element, and then a normalized standardized version of that date according to an ISO standard um, in the normal attribute. And that's kind of similar for the sub elements of control access where the normal attribute essentially provides you with a normalized standardized form of the elements content. So for example, 
um, putting not Albert Einstein, but Einstein, comma, Albert, comma, 1879 to 1955, including the birth and death date. The role attribute, just to mention that as well with regard to the agents and the places, uh, is meant to provide a contextual role or relationship that the entity named in the element has to the materials that are being described. For example, as I mentioned earlier, we can designate the person or an organization as being the creator of the materials. How does this look like in EAD3? Um, and you can see, so everything that is in light blue is something that has been added in EAD3. And everything that is in light orange is something that has essentially be renamed. So the attribute or the function was there already, but we found a different name for it. And what you might also see is that the sub-elements of control access has, have been more aligned in the ED3 context. The main difference between ED 2002 and ED 3 in the context of control access is that all sub-elements now have a part sub-element in themselves. So corp name or geog name or subject cannot contain the text anymore themselves, but you will have to put that text into the part element. I'm just going to have a brief example of how that will look like. So part can either be used as a single string. Um, so you could just potentially put Albert Einstein into a single part element if you wanted to, or you can make use of the part element and break the part down into several parts. So as you can see in the example below, you could have one part saying Einstein, one part saying Albert, and one part giving the birth and the death date of Albert Einstein. And similarly, you could have an example like this from the subject um, sub element, um, where you could kind of break down uh, the Library of Congress subject headings um, into their different parts. Maybe also to, to mention um, is that the part element itself also comes with these vocabulary attributes. So in theory, uh, specifically with the second example of the subject, if you had identifiers for the subject railroad mm -hmm. and the subject fares and the subject special rates distinctively, you could also use the identifier attribute in the part itself rather than only using it on the subject element level. And with this, I'm handing over to Gerhard for the use case. So I'm going to stop my sharing and leave the floor to him. OK, Cassie. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, first of all, thank you for having me. And thank you for your comprehensive overview of EAD elements designated to encode access points, especially the wrapper element control access. It is my pleasant duty now to welcome you to the second part of the webinar. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to introduce you to the Canadian Unit Catalog, a permanent cataloging and aggregation service of the Berlin State Library, and to discuss our approach to encoding control terms in archive descriptions based on EAD 2002. Just a few words about Calliope. Um, the Berlin State Library was establishing Calliope with the support of the German Research Foundation, while also digitizing printed directories to personal papers and centralized narrative catalogs in the late 90s and early aughts. Control vocabularies, the authority type of the German National Library in particular, have been a key cataloging service from the get-go. <clears throat> Today, the Calliope Union Catalog is a consortium of 91 libraries, archives, and museums to collaborate on maintaining a joint infrastructure to create and to index archival findings. So far, the catalog provides access to archival materials held by over 640 organizations. And as for March 2023, the Calliope catalog indexed over 29,200 finding aids and over 400,000 descriptions 
of related agents. Common basis for the creation of data and condition of indexation are descriptive standards and controlled vocabulary. The commonly applied standards are, <clears throat> with regard to descriptive standards, the general international standard archive description for describing archival collections and finding aids, and resource description and access, IEA, for sharing data about agents with the integrated authority file of the German National Library. We apply encoding standards, EAD and EAC-CPF but also Mark 21 and the Metadata Object Description Schema, MODS, for encoding and reusing data. We also provide standard cataloging services, which is mainly the integrated authority file of the German National Library as a supporting column to identify entities across collections and holding organizations uniquely, and to share data, especially about agents in a broader context. In addition to the integrated authority file, a library makes use of controlled vocabularies, for example, terms for languages or relators. Finally, yet importantly, we identify holding organizations, data creators, and data providers with a unique code and international standard identifier for libraries and related organizations, which is based on the ISO 15.5.11. As mentioned, the integrated sort of file is a pivotal instrument of the Calliope Union catalog. As from October 2022, it provides access to 9.5 million records, 5.8 million records about people and families, 1.7 million records about corporate bodies, 874,000 records about congresses, 351,000 records about places, 219 sub thousand subject headings, and another 485,000 named cultural objects birth. <clears throat> the integrated sort of file is a network of libraries, archives, and museums, mainly in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And as a cataloging service, it aims at distinct entities, consistent identification, and cross domain interoperability. The German National Library provides multiple interfaces and data formats to share and reuse authority data. Here, the virtual international authority file is a service of OCLC to cluster the same entities that have multiple authority files. And it is therefore possible, for example, to trace the entities identified by a control number from an authority file that is indexed by PIA across local, national, or international catalogs, portals, or any other repository. Wikidata, for example, or uh, the Wikimedia Foundation, provides a very similar service. As a client union catalog, <clears throat> we encode relations to multiple entity types, holding organizations with a web element repository, agents with origination and Control access, same as places, documentary form types, and topics. The screenshot on the right shows a record of the individual sort file indexed by the Calliope Union catalog. And the sort control number indicates us linking to both internal and external sources, archival records, or any other biographical information, etc. <clears throat> Okay, let's go a bit more detail. I continue this example for the rubber elements repository, which is used to enter holding organizations, origination used to enter record trader, and last but not least, control access used to enter entities which are identified with the description of archival materials. So, encode organizations we use a child element properly. <clears throat> the name of the holding organization is encoded as plain element content. The attribute role encodes the German term for repository. The attribute sort encodes an information from the database providing the code of the holding organization, which is the international standard identifier. And the attribute also itself to encode the code of the holding organization. 
The Kalaipa Union Catalog does not index any data about holding organizations, but requests data on reply from the national agency, for example, the address, the website, and email address of a holding organization. Okay, <clears throat> second example origination. The use of verbal elements of the end of references to persons, families, or corporate bodies responsible for the creation or accumulation of the archive material. The approach is similar to encoding holding organization. Child elements, depending on the entity type of a reference agent, person, corporate, family, and code claim names. When available, we add the dates of existence in round brackets to simplify the retrieval. <clears throat> The attribute role and with the German term for origination, attribute sort and with the abbreviation of the authority file, the attribute author number and with the control number, attribute normal and with authority name for of an agent. Third example control access. Any entities identified with the description of archival materials are encoded with a rapid element control access and its child elements depending on the entity type person, corporate bodies, families, places, topics, documentary form. The approach of encoding data is again very similar to the first two rapid elements of control and origination. Child element content encodes plain names of reference entities. The attribute role encodes relators to describe the nature of the relation. The attribute sort encodes the abbreviation of the authority file. The attribute author number encodes the control number. And the attribute norm encodes the authority name form. Some few additional examples. This example demonstrates the encoding of a documentary form type. <clears throat> On the right, a screenshot taken from the catalog application. It shows you a drop down menu. Archivists can choose one or more terms from the controlled list of vocabularies. The selected term is then encoded in ED with a child element journal form, accompanied by attributes, sort, and author number. So the cataloger himself or herself. Does not need to input any um, author number or source codes, um, but just select the term and the machine is doing um, the best. <clears throat> the second last example shows another drop down menu from the cataloging application. Um, archivists not only link an entity like a person with a record of the authority file, but chooses a related term from a controlled list. Like uh, he's a creator or author, writer, uh, recipient of the letter, for example. Um, <clears throat> and um, the machine is encoding um, all the data in EAD with the first name, the role attribute, source, author number, the normal form of the um, sorting file, um, etc. This last example demonstrates linking archive descriptions. With an authority record. <clears throat> um, the slide displays a screenshot taken from the cataloging application, and it shows two overlapping application windows. In the back is a form used to describe records. At the lower end, you see a table with two columns that are used to encode places or situation of the record. The right column encodes the name of the place used in the record described. It is captured as plain text. The left column opens a retrieval window to search for authority records. If an archivist identifies a play for the result list, this place can be linked. Otherwise, the archivist can create a new record. And we encode both name forms, the name of the place from the right record, and the authority form together with the control number and related term. Okay, a bit more generic. The authority file is kind of a part of the cataloging application. Archivists can download or upload a record and thus share data with the integrated authority file. 
The code of the voting organization, uh, on the other hand, is added manually, manually with the login details we provide to voting organizations that do the cataloging with the cataloging application. All data created by member organizations or provided by a data provider apply the same standards as I mentioned earlier. Finding aids are encoded based on EAD, data about the lack of creators on the, um, on, are encoded in ECCPF. The online catalog is indexing the data. It provides a user interface for information retrieval and a web protocol search retrieve via URL, SRU, to access archival descriptions, even in some L formats like W4 or MODS. Okay, <clears throat> um, EAD 2002 and EAD 3, uh, as Kerstin uh, mentioned, share very similar approaches to any correlation. The revision of ECPF introduced a new approach. Just to give you some few examples, <clears throat> um, and not to dig into too many details, in EAD, names of child elements specify the entity type of a related entity. Core name, first name, family. The wrapper element relation in ECTPF, on the other hand, encoded the entity type with a more generic child element target entity. There is an attribute target type which provides control terms, which makes the schema maintenance more flexible with new entity types. EAD child elements provide attributes to encode control numbers or a URI of a reference entity. However, the fault of the control number cannot be specified by a URI itself. The ECTPF schema introduced a new attribute vocabulary sort URI. So it makes it more of better, I think, uh, a better identification of the fault itself. EAD 2002 and EAD 3 provide a single attribute to encode the nature of a relation. Its target role, ECTPF, provides it conveniently to be more specific about control vocabulary use. The ECTPF approach does not cause any additional efforts to archivists, but enhances sharing and indexing data by aggregators. So <clears throat> I'm coming to a conclusion. <clears throat> EED provides elements and attributes to encode relations. However, some values are not standardized. Uh, and we use it um, by our own definitions, um, like um, the codes um, by abbreviations um, for the fourth um, of an authority record, and need thus human interaction to explain the meaning. So IFIL needs to be explained to someone who wants to aggregate the data of the black unit catalog, or source GNB. Does need explanations outside of the German speaking countries. Therefore, with the current revision of EAD underway, we should discuss a more advanced approach to encode and to encode control vocabularies. This should also include at least recommendations about control vocabularies supporting cross cultural heritage interoperability. The encoding should also be more generic for better maintenance instead of naming element names after entity types, we might use control vocabularies. Mm -hmm. Finally, I'd like to take this chance to encourage you <coughs> um, to <coughs> use control vocabularies in archival description. Control vocabularies contribute significantly to the quality of data and paves the way for new services. So far, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much for this use case, Gerhard. I'm going to um, share my screen again and just take you um, through a little introduction of ESCCPF. Um, so we wanted to concentrate on EAD, but um, as our sister standard, uh, we also wanted to at least show a brief look on ESCCPF on the newest version, which was published last year in August after um, a major revision. Um, for anyone who doesn't know it, um, ESCCPF stands for Encoded Archival Context, Corporate Bodies, Persons and Families, and has been an SAA standard since 2011. Um, similar to EAD, it is an XML schema to encode descriptions of entities 
and their relationships with one another or with other entities, such as, for example, the resources that you would des describe in EAD. ECCPF is an implementation of the ICA standard ESA CPF, uh, which has been published initially in 1996. Um, and as mentioned, um, a second version of ECCPF was just published last year in August. Um, there was an introductory webinar, which I've linked here on um, this slide. Um, the slides will be shared uh, with you after this presentation, um, so you can also kind of watch the more detailed introduction into ECCPF um, that the colleagues did. There also is a website for ECCPF where you can find the schema, where you can find the tag library, where you can find the best practice guide that was created in the context of ECCPF 2.0. Um, so all of that gives you uh, different entry points into understanding what ECCPF is about. Um, and just to briefly mention this, there is um, not that much required in ECCPF, similar to EAD, which doesn't require that much if you uh, look at how the schema is defined. Um, so ECCPF also has something that is called a control section, which information, which holds information about the ECCPF file itself. Um, so it gives you information about whether this is a newly created file, whether it's a file that has been revised. Um, it gives an identifier for the ECCPF file and it gives a little bit of information about who has created or updated that ECCPF file and when did kind of major updates happen in the maintenance history. Um, there also is, of course, a requirement to identify the entity that you are describing within ECCPF. Um, so that is done within the CPF description element and in there with in the identity sub element. And the only two things that you have to do essentially is identifying whether you are describing a corporate body, a person or a family, and to give that entity that you are describing a name. And that's essentially all that you have to do with ECCPF. On the other hand, there are lots of things that you can do with ECCPF, and that kind of brings together what we've just been talking about in the context of ED, because also ECCPF has elements that allow you to encode controlled access terms. So, for example, in the description section, you have things like the function element or the application element. You have an element to encode places um, and various other elements that allow you to provide those access terms within the ECCPF description. And as Gerhard already mentioned briefly, um, there also is the relations element, uh, which has been kind of revised in the ECCPF revision. So we kind of have come to a more generic model for describing uh, relations. And uh, we also have allowed for more possibilities to also provide controlled access terms for things like the relation type or the target role, which in the ED context, as we've seen earlier, um, is currently only possible to kind of be named, um, but we can't do much more with it. Um, and just to give you an example on how this looks like in the encoding, um, when my slides move, sorry about that. There we are. Um, so this is an example uh, taken from um, the ECCPF homepage, so to say, on GitHub um, in the best practice guide. Uh, it's an example for describing relations within a description of the Mozart family. Um, and I've just kind of taken out how Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart himself would be described in there. And you can see highlighted the three vocabulary elements that ECCPF uses. Um, these are called vocabulary source. So that's similar to the source element that we have seen earlier in EAD. And then we've got value URI, which is the auth file number or the identifier in EAD3. Um, and the new attribute is the vocabulary source URI. So also giving you the possibility to not only name the vocabulary that you're taking the term from, but also giving the URI if that exists for that vocabulary. Um, and you can see that we have um, also used URIs in the local type. Um, so kind of also making this more um, linked open data, semantic web 
um, appropriate, so to say. And at the bottom, you see the relation type and in, in two variations, so to say, um, with a value URI and the vocabulary source URI um, and kind of giving the information that Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart is a member of the Mozart family in this context. And to round things up, a um, sneak peek on the ongoing revision of EAD and a uh, plea for feedback. Uh, so in terms of the revision, um, the new version, that's, that's a decision that has already been taken, will adopt those three um, vocabulary um, attributes that ECCPF 2.0 has introduced because one of the objectives of the revision is also to align EAD and ECCPF a little bit more so that we are actually kind of using the same elements and the same attributes in both standards if we want to do the same things. Um, and the use of the relations element, which in ED3 was only introduced as something experimental, is under more intense review in terms of what we can do with this in the context of ED. And then, and I'm going to stop sharing my slide because I will also want to put the link to the survey in the chat. Um, this is just kind of a really brief survey um, because we are interested in how you're using access terms. Um, so anyone who uh, has a spare win minute is very welcome to provide us your feedback there. Um, and otherwise I will, first of all, thank you for your attention. Thank uh, Gerhard for his contribution. Um, ask Karen to stop the recording and we'll open the floor for any questions that you might have or comments or thoughts that you want to share.